Buonasera e benvenuti a tutti ad un nuovo appuntamento, in realtà l'ultimo di questa stagione, della serie Museo e ricerca, le conferenze dei curatori del Museo Egizio. Tonight we are very pleased to be hosting the lecture of Cedric Gobeil, Egyptologist, archaeologist and since 2019 curator at the Museo Egizio. Uh, before being appointed in Turin, he was also director of the Egypt Exploration Society and director of the excavations at Der El Medina on behalf of the IFAO, the French Archaeological Institute in Cairo. Tonight, he will uh, present the first results of the new archaeological fieldwork conducted by the Museo Egizio at the site of Der El Medina on the west bank of Luxor under the umbrella and general concession of the French Archaeological Institute in Cairo. All right, so just um, a final note. Uh, at the end of the lecture, there will be some time for a few questions and uh, we will be collecting them uh, during the lecture through the YouTube chat and the Facebook comments. So please write your questions there and we will try to answer them. All right then, we are ready to go and Cedric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for being uh, here with me uh, live for this uh, last uh, presentation uh, of the season uh, from the Museo Egizio. So um, really thank you for being here. And especially I would like to extend my thanks to uh, all our American friends that have been invited to view my presentation uh, today. So uh, first of all, before uh, entering uh, in the, the core of my presentation, I would uh, especially like to thank uh, all our team at Museo Egizio for their support. Also our Egyptian workmen, of course, and uh, the partnership institutions as well. So the IFO and Politecnico Milano. And most of all, of course, the Ministry of State for Antiquities without which nothing can happen. So tonight's uh, presentation is, uh, as Paolo was telling you, uh, to, to give you a brief account of our latest results uh, of our current research that had been done uh, at Der El Medina. So all this uh, is been done under, uh, the, the, thanks to the signature of a memorandum of understanding uh, that, has, that has been signed and agreed between uh, us, Museo Egizio, and our partnership institution, the IFAO, uh, as Paolo was mentioning, who, which has the concession, the general concession of the site of Daryl Medina. So I would like here to thank both directors for having signed this memorandum of understanding, namely Laurent Bavet and Christian Greco. So it is with great pleasure that uh, 115 years after Schiaparelli, we are now, Museo Gizio is now able to go back to Daryl Medina to uh, resume uh, the fieldwork. <clears throat> so, a mutual agreement has been reached by both institutions, uh, Museo Egizio and IFO, to outline the work uh, Museo Egizio should carry on the site prior to do any field work at all. So a few tombs have been selected uh, with the final goal, final aim to publish them and to conserve them. So these uh, tombs, uh, among uh, the, the ones we are authorized to work on, are uh, namely the TT214 belonging to Hawi then the TT8 belonging to Ra, and the TT338 belonging to Maya. Uh, I must highlight the fact that we, the Memorandum of Understanding uh, uh, also mentioned that we, uh, we would have the agreement to work also on the TT10 belonging to Penbui uh, then, but since uh, no field work has been done yet, so the, the work has not started in situ, uh, this is the reason why then I will leave this to outside of my presentation today. So this, these three tombs will then serve as the frame of my today's presentation. The choice uh, of these three tombs uh, is far from being random, obviously. So the IFO and Museo Egizio have made an agreement upon these, these tombs, firstly and may, mostly because Museo Egizio possesses many artifacts that used to belong to the owners of these tombs. So uh, you have then, for instance, just to mention the TT214, Hawi, 
Museo Jicho, among other artifacts, possess this uh, lintel and two door jams that we, we have in our collection. And the TT8, of course, uh, has been found unviolated. The tomb has been found unviolated by Schiaparelli in 1906. So apart from a few objects that have remained in Egypt, we have all Museo Jicho possess all the content of the tomb. So of, that was an obvious choice for the TT8. And finally, the 338, the uh, tomb of Maya, we uh, decided also to work on this tool because the decoration of the tomb chapel is now housed in our collection since it has been found also in 1906 by Schiaparelli and Schiaparelli decided to bring this de decoration inside our museum. So basically part of our work uh, that should be done on these three tombs uh, is as the, the final goal, one of the aim really to make a link between our collection, the artifacts that we have in our collection, and the past work that has been done in situ. We, in an effort of recontextualization, it was really important for us to, and for our director, Christian Greco, to bring a lot of context, the most context as possible, to find the context of findings of all these objects and monuments. So this is also why we have chosen to work on these monuments. But first, let's have a look at where these tombs are located uh, in the site of Dar al-Medina. So as you see here on the screen, they are all located in the Western Necropolis at the foothill of the Western Mountain. So for uh, the TT214, uh, as you see, it's located at the extreme south of the Necropolis, whereas the two others, the TT8 and 338, they are both located in the northern part of the Western Necropolis. And TT8 and 338 are standing side by side, just a few meters away from each other. So that would be the uh, location where we are uh, we, and will be working uh, at Dar al -Medina. So before engaging any work on the field, we, we had first of all to carry an assessment of what we knew about each tomb and its owner. So for this, we extensively, extensively use the archive documents that we have and that were also uh, kept at the IFA. So not only the ones made and produced by Schiaparelli has been used, but also the ones made by Bernard Bruyère for the FO, and uh, which are now, for most of them, available online. So I think to support the opportunity of, tonight, of today's presentation to uh, draw your attention on the, the, the web address where you can uh, have a look by yourself to all the wonderful archives that have been produced uh, by Bruyère that are now kept uh, at the, the IFO. So. Looking closely at the case of the TT214, the first two of today's presentation, so most of the archive useful to our work uh, were made, uh, a, in fact, by Bernard Bruyère and are now kept at the IFAO. So before our work, these plans and drawings and epigraphic survey were the, the only ones uh, made for this tomb. So they, they are the ones that would soon after be published in Bruyère's report. So as you see here on the screen to the left, you have the, some epigraphic uh, records that have been sketches by Bernard Bruyère. Yeah? It was really important for him when he entered the tomb, when he found it in 1921, to uh, assess and survey uh, as much as possible all the, the, uh, the texts that were kept inside the tomb, so the chapel as well as the uh, burial chamber. So as you see now on the two other uh, images. So you have in the one in the middle, the, the chapel, so the, the uh, let's say the, the, the superstructure of the tomb uh, itself. So it is made by a front open courtyard leading to a chapel, a rock cut chapel, this chapel being made of two uh, uh, separate rooms. And the uh, access to the a series of three burial chambers is done through, uh, is made through uh, via a vertical shaft uh, open in the front courtyard, as you see on the center image. And then these three uh, burial chambers that you can see on the right image uh, are uh, made in, in a succession order. So we have room number one, then room number two, and number three. And this room number three, the final room, is the only one that has been decorated or at least has survived with its decoration. So this is also on which uh, on, the, on this is on this room that we will of course focus part of, uh, the, of that the, the presentation of tonight will be focused. Uh, of course, in addition to the plan of the tombs, Bria made uh, really nice facsimile drawings of the decoration of the tombs. 
So, and also drawings of fragments that were already kept at the Museo Egizio. Like all these elements of the, the door found during the campaign 1908 and 1909 uh, that I've shown you, uh, of which you, you've seen the pictures earlier uh, today, in uh, a few slides ago. Uh, so you see Ben Abria himself did almost the same work that we are trying to do now. He, ha he, he scattered, he got all around the world to uh, get maximum information on the tomb itself and the, the tomb owner, so Rawi in this case. So all these documents would be later published in his report. So it was then for us very important to assess these records in order for us to check if there would be anything different from nowadays, from what we could see in the tombs once we would be inside it, to see if there would be any discrepancies. So together with all the documents kept in the archive, many information have also been gathered from the published reports of Bruyère and also from uh, the, the pictures that he took uh, himself. So as you see here on the screen, two uh, examples of the pictures he took. So the front of the chapel, the rock cut chapel, and uh, to the right, a stela. And Bria makes some notes that this stela regarding the iconography and the text should have been located initially inside the niche on the front side of the pyramid, which one stood above the chapel that you see. Bria found some traces of this pyramid that once have topped the rock cut chapel. But nowadays, of course, uh, these traces have uh, disappeared. So this is why also it's very important to make like a sort of archaeology of the archive in order to retrieve these traces, which are nowadays absolutely invisible. It was also important for us to fully reassess this tomb because uh, prior to our work, only a few black and white pictures of the decorated burial chamber existed, like uh, the one you're seeing now on the screen, and which has been taken by Ben Abre in 1921. The reason of this is because shortly after the discovery of the tomb in 1921, so Briere re recalls it must have been somewhere between 1925 and 1926, a big collapse of the upper levels of the area uh, actually happened, condemning the entrance of the burial chamber for more than 100 years. Actually, in his report, Briere notes that uh, he thought back then that it would have been a too big effort to remove all the debris and rubbles that have accumulated at the entrance of this decorated burial chamber. So this is why he decided to never go back again. So this is also why it was quite important for us during our uh, first visit on the site to go back there, remove the rubbles and debris, and then to be the first one to re-enter the tomb since Bria. And that's what we have done. Uh, indeed, as you see here on the screen, the geology of the area is very poor and very fragile. Uh, the location of the TT214 is at the very ending point of what we call the material cone of the western mountain. So all the rock, debris and rubbles have rolled uh, to that very ending point for during millennia and have accumulated there in fragile strata. So this is what flash floods happening uh, we rain, uh, wind, etc. Everything has accumulated there in very fragile strata. So when uh, Hawi decided to install his tomb there, he might have not noticed it, but anyway, it was the only place maybe left for him back then. And this is why he put his tomb there in a very fragile uh, strata. The problem of that, you see the result, is a very bad and unstable stratification of the mountain in, in this area. And this is why we could say that a collapse happened or collapses might happen from time to time, but one happened in the 1920s. And this very collapse actually resulting in a huge hole, as you see, the, 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 the mountain has actually collapsed and you even see part of the mountain just really standing in balance above our head. This must have been caused in fact by vibrations produced during the excavation made by Bria himself. He must have fragilized the area, and this is why this would have happened in the 1920s, soon, very soon after uh, his excavation, unfortunately. So then, prior to our work, here's what we did, knew, uh, we did know sorry, about the tomb and his owner. So uh, we knew that the name of the owner, of course, was Hawi. 
We know that he was a, a guardian in the place of truth, so a guardian of the site of Daral Medina, a very important task, actually. And uh, so important that uh, comparing to the second title, Servant of Amun of Opet, this title of guardian is the most recurrent one uh, on all his monuments. So this title and function must have been very important to him. Then we knew that thanks to list of delivery, uh, delivery of goods, also salary, rooster, etc., that he lived during the reign of Ramses II. We also know thanks to his monuments and of which uh, mostly is doom, that he had a wife called Taweret and together they had a son named Hui. It is possible that his wife and son were also buried with him in his tomb, but unfortunately, when the burial chamber was first reopened by Ben Abriyah in 1921, no mummies were found. So that's what we knew, at least from uh, the, what, uh, all the documents that we could have seen from, uh, and gathered from Hawi. So our work on site for the TT214 was organized following three logical steps, and this is what, uh, that, that's uh, the strategy that we have established prior to going there. So, First of all, we had, of course, to clean and re-excavate even uh, all the debris and rubbish that had accumulated over the last hundred years in the tomb. So some layers uh, were so thick that even sometimes really it looked almost like if we were re-excavating the tomb. So that was the first step to do. And second, once uh, cleaned, the tomb and all the findings uh, had to be surveyed and studied and photographed. And that, this is also what we have done. And finally, as a third step, uh, the tomb has to be conserved and preserved following a thorough assessment of its state and condition. So the, this assessment has been done last February by uh, Bianca Madden. So now we are waiting for the next season to do this uh, and then to actively start conserving this tomb as a third and final step. So here are some pictures before and after of uh, our cleaning operation that we have been uh, doing during the first and second part uh, of the campaign. So we found that the ground in the front courtyard was in fact, uh, so this is what you see in the uh, two uh, left images. So this front courtyard was in fact uh, an artificial horizon created by Briere for the visitors. So what, what we understand is that he used the debris produced from his excavations of, and, and cleanings of the whole Western necropolis to create this uh, artificial horizon. So the reason why we know this is because in the thickness of the ground, we found many fragments of human remains, pottery shirts, textiles, uh, etc., and other small finds. And these small finds had nothing to do there. They, had, they were absolutely not linked with the tomb itself. So that was a clue that we, we got. Um, then in the two central images, you see the before and after condition of the, the entrance of the, the, the room number three of the decorated burial chamber. So we have to remove uh, tens and tens of centimeters, if not just to, to say maybe up to one meter uh, thick of debris in order to reach the entrance of this uh, burial chamber. And finally, the right images, you see there the room number one. So when we got in, this room was exposed to a lot of wind, so it had accumulated a lot of debris and rubbish. So you see our Egyptian workmen had a, basically to crawl just beneath the vaulted ceiling of that, that room in order to start cleaning uh, the debris. And then finally, at the bottom right image, you, we finally were able to find the uh, bottom part of the mud brick casing that once was uh, really hiding the rock cut, uh, the, the, this rock cut tomb, uh, room, sorry, and was preserving the wall. So we see clearly how it was made. So again, that has been achieved for the first time after 100 years. Here, just for the pleasure of the eye, some examples of the small finds we found during the first uh, year of our work. So they will all need to be studied, of course, during uh, the coming season. So we found many uh, shaptis of the late period. So that's what we see uh, in the inside the, life, the left image. Also some fragments of shaptis of New Kingdom. This is the image in the, to the right, uh, to, sorry, in the center. And then to the right, you have two images. So we found a few ostracals. So this is one of the most, I would say, complete one we found. And also pieces of smashed and crashed uh, yellow coffin, as you see on the bottom right 
part of the image. Even if these objects could have come, come, come from the TT214, we cannot be sure that they were coming from uh, this tomb precisely because they were found among, uh, along with other small finds that have clearly nothing to do with this tomb. And as for the human remains that we found, so we found them all in fragmentary state, in many different state of conditions, so some in state of skeleton, some mummy shape, uh, all very disturbed and uh, very fragmentary, as you see here on the left image. So thus proving then that the fine spots were absolutely not uh, the ones where we, we found them. And then to the image to the right, you see the workmen, Egyptian workmen, during uh, their work. Uh, just to give you a few numbers, we found uh, a few hundreds of small finds uh, within a thickness, I would say, of 25, 30 centimeters uh, on inside the front courtyard. So again, just, just to give you uh, an extent of the work that Briere has been doing in order to uh, recreate an artificial horizon for the visitors to access the entrance of the chapel. Uh, in the important thickness of debris and rubbish, we will move from inside room number two, so inside the, the second burial chamber. Uh, this is also a fun part. We found fragments of uh, Italian newspapers from 1905, clearly belonging to Schiaparelli's work, so a, a trace uh, that Schiaparelli, of course, was there and something that he left on site after having done his work. So that was also something uh, fun to note. In the, in the center uh, of the screen, you see a grocery list uh, of the 1920s made by Bernard Breyer. And this is made uh, based on the, the um, comparison of the writing of this grocery list with the writing uh, of his uh, notebooks. So we have assessed that it was clearly, it's in, of course, it's in French. So this is clearly something, a trace left from the French mission uh, during the 1920s when he was working uh, around the TT214 and also personal correspondence of the 1970s, uh, mid-70s, since you see here an envelope uh, addressed uh, to Professor Dominique Valbel. So back then she was, a, Dominique Valbel was a student, she was working in Deron Medine uh, from 1972 to 1976. So uh, that's also something uh, that was quite amusing to find in the debris. And this is also letting us uh, trying to think of what kind of debris, if any, we would have left on site and to be found again in 100 years by other archaeologists. So now we are absolutely aware of that, so we will be very careful of what we leave, if we leave anything on the site. But finally came the moment uh, we were all waiting for, uh, the, the reopening of the decorated burial chambers, so room number three on the series of the, the three burial chambers. So for the first time since Bruyere. So you have here a few uh, steps uh, taken in pictures. So starting from the left, so this was when we started to see the vertical cut cuttings of the entrance uh, of the, the, the first uh, steps of the, uh, the entrance. Then the second picture, we, could be, we would begin to see, you could begin to see the, the bottom part of the, the top lintel of the door. And then in the third picture, we had some steps already and we had begun to remove the stones left by Bruyere uh, to block the entrance of this room. And finally, the fourth picture, the last one on the right, this is how we left the tomb once we, uh, our work has been carried. The, so we, we put a metal door in order to protect uh, the tomb from looters and in order also to facilitate the comeback from uh, us and other Egyptologists who, should anyone wanted to see the interior of this tomb so they would not have to of course to remove all the debris like we did so the entrance the re-entrance would be very easy so that was for the first step of uh, the work on the tt214 then the second step surveying and studying so after uh, our thorough cleaning our colleague alessandro mandelli from politecnico milano uh, came to help us to carry a new topographical survey of the exterior and interior parts of the TT214. And this is what he has been doing during the first season. So by installing a few targets and by using a total station and computer software, he has been able to completely survey the tomb, the TT214, so inside and outside. And this is, uh, I was very impressed by his work, very thorough and very uh, swiftly done and very precisely done. 
in only a few days. So this is something that in the past, during Schiaparelli and Ebrial excavation, would have taken many days, many weeks. Now this work can be done in a few hours, in a few days. Also, while carrying the topographical survey of the inside and outside of the tomb, Alessandro has also been uh, carrying a, a survey of all the fragments that were found inside the tomb. So as you see, the fragmentary reliefs found on the floor of the chapel uh, has also been processed in order to get maximum information from them and so to be able ultimately to put them back to their original position inside the tomb chapel. So here you have an example of the work done, uh, allowing to enhance the readability as well of the, the fragments that we have found. So firstly, what, we, what Alessandro has done, he has made auto photo of them, he has scanned them, then making 3D models of them, of certain, uh, of some of them. We are then able to connect, to reconnect and really some of them. And then as we have also a model of the walls of the chapel, we are able virtually to replace them, to know exactly where they are, in order to ensure a future and to allow a future uh, anastylosis to be made uh, inside this chapel, uh, conservation of this chapel and its decorated walls. So thanks to his valuable work, we have also been able to get a new plan and a new section cut of the tomb with a precision to the millimeter. So you see, this is what Alessandro has been doing. So to the left, you have the plan of the upper part of the tomb, so the uh, outside and interior of the chapel. And then in dark, uh, in, in gray, you have the uh, network of burial chambers that are running uh, underneath the tomb. And this is what you can see uh, on the section cut to the right. So one of the methods used by Alessandro was uh, photogrammetry. So for those of you who would not know what photogrammetry is, is a method using uh, hundreds if not thousands of uh, pictures taken by a simple camera. And once you are uh, covering some areas by the same and varying the angles of your camera, the, you allow the camera with the help of a computer software to make an assessment of the entreaty of the volume. So you get really an idea of the true dimension of a shape. It can be an exterior, it can be an, outs, uh, an, an, an interior, it can also be an object. So thanks to this method, Alessandro has been able to create this 3D rendering model of the tomb. So you see the tomb within its environment. So it's allow, it allows us, of course, to understand better the relationship of this tomb with the other ones surrounding it, but also to understand the relationship between uh, the tombs and the burial chambers. Maybe ultimately to understand why some burial chamber have a specific access, it's because it was to avoid another one. Also, a good, good thing to bear in mind is for the people who either would not or could not access this particular tomb in Egypt, that would be also a good occasion uh, for them to understand and even maybe to visit this tomb. Since Alessandro has also been able to create a short movie. So it's like you being a small uh, bird and flying literally inside the tomb, going out and going inside the uh, subterranean network of the burial chamber. So this, of course, uh, simple method can bring a lot of good results and it's very interesting to use. Among other things, the front courtyard of the TT214 contains a, a never published stela with a double scene depicting Hawi kneeling before Hamun and before Rearati. And below Hawi and his wife Tawaret appear uh, the god Osiris. So this stela, as you can see on the screen, is badly damaged by uh, weather condition and the scenes are uh, mostly erased and very faded. So Alessandro is currently working on a process to increase the readability and to allow of this stila and to allow us to see its most faded parts, uh, as you can see to the right of, at the right of your screen. And this is a work in progress. So as you see, we can begin to uh, see a few lines of the decoration and uh, columns of text, but uh, I am, we are pretty confident that in the coming months, Alessandro will be able then to uh, increase the readability of this uh, text and uh, economy and scene and decoration more than just what you can see now. 
As for the chapel itself, uh, the decoration uh, has been left unfinished, unfortunately. So as you see uh, on the right image, and uh, the part that was decorated has been carved, as you see uh, on the left image. And this is actually the, the best part of the chapel. The reason why this chapel has been left unfinished uh, is most probably the, uh, let's say, the premature death of the owner. Uh, it's worthy to note that the carvings are only located in the entrance of the chapel, so outside and inside, including the lintel and the door jam, as you see in the center image. This is the, the reason to that is because the chapel uh, was supposed to be left open after the death of the owner, and therefore it, the chapel was acting as a kind of an adver advertisement or publicity of the life of the deceased in order to attract the offerings on him. So this is the reason why it was very important for him to to show the maximum, so it means the entrance was the, of course, the, the part of the chapel most visible. And that would explain why this part was the only one decorated, or at least the first one to be decorated. But in addition to its original decoration, the chapel also contains mini graffiti, figurative ones, as you see to the left, then hieratic ones, as you see in the middle, and demotic ones, as you see to the right. These last ones being uh, currently under the study by Didier de Vauchel. So what these graffiti tell us, in fact, is that after the burial of Hawi, the TT214 also became the burial place of many other people over a very long period of time. Like for instance, the demotic graffiti uh, uh, tells us that actually this was the burial place of uh, X or Y, Z, uh, some people that they died at this very moment and of course uh, they were uh, the child the, the, the son or daughter of that and that person showing us that indeed the tt214 has been the burial place of many other people and for the figurative one and the hieratic ones it shows that people during pharaonic time came either to pay homage to to as a, a kind of a devotion uh, to Hawi, but also maybe also to highlight the fact that they could also have reused this tomb uh, for themselves or some, for some member of their own family. So as you see, this tomb became almost a necropolis in itself, or at least a columbarium. So here finally are the first color pictures ever taken of the decorated burial chamber, the one that we reopened 100 years after Briere. So as you see, while the partial decoration of the chapel was carved, is carved on limestone, this decorated burial chamber is painted. So uh, it has been cut, rock cut, then covered with a casing of uh, mud brick. And then the mud brick has been covered by a clay uh, plaster. And this clay plaster has been painted over. And the, the topics uh, depicted are very traditional for their own Medina. So uh, the owner, his wife, uh, giving uh, offerings to a, a series of divinities, gods and goddesses. And the style of its decoration is uh, uh, very peculiar to their Medina. It's called a monochrome style, following Briere's interpretation. The monochrome style actually should have looked like the picture on the left, as you see. So white background, yellow, you know, silhouette, so yellow elements, outlined in red with some bits uh, detailed in black. But as you see in the two right images, uh, actually the burial chamber, the, the, the color is mostly pink. You have different degrees uh, of uh, and shades of pink on a white background. The reason of that is actually a fire happened. The tomb, this burial chamber, has been damaged by a fire sometime during the antiquity. We don't know when. But there was no direct fire inside this very room because there's no smoke nor soot, no black uh, on the ceiling, as you have noticed in the uh, er, early in the previous uh, slide. So this room, in fact, was cooked like in an oven. So the pigments were only uh, let's say, I've seen not direct fire, but the, the air that was kept inside this room when it was sealed, actually was overheated by a fire that had happened right in the room before, so in room number two. And this is why a chemical process had happened, and all the yellow ochres have 
change color, they have turned to pink. So uh, this is uh, what we, we can say about this. Uh, we, one of the hypotheses we have about why this has happened, we have happened. We think this, uh, when this tomb was reused as a, a house or a storeroom, when the chapel was reused as a, a place to, for people to, to live in, maybe in the storage, if they were storing straw or very inflammable material, maybe some fire happened. And obviously a fire happened while this last room was sealed, unfortunately. And this is what led uh, to this change of uh, color. Other, another peculiarity of this tomb is that on the west wall, you see, uh, as you see on the, uh, on the left image, is the embalming scene with Anubis. But this scene is the only one in Deir el Medina, because this scene is very classical, very traditional in Deir el Medina. And this is the only scene where another person is involved. Usually this scene, you have Anubis taking care of the mummy lying on a funerary bed. But in this case, someone have, has had a person. And in this case, it seems that we himself, so the son, how we son, have had the, the, his the own depiction to the scene. We know that it has been done in a second step, because if you look carefully in their left image, the uh, foreleg, the, the leg in front of uh, Hui, is covering a hieroglyphic sign. So obviously there is a hieroglyphic text running beneath, behind Hui's body, and this text has been covered. Also, we know that different pigments have been used, because if you imagine that the hot air has been spread all over the wall, why the face of the mummy remain yellow while the body of uh, Uwe is pink? So obviously there were two different batches of yellow ochres used, and this is why they didn't change the same way. They didn't evolve the same way. So for all that reason, we do plan in the future to go back with a special camera, multispectral camera, to make an assessment trying to find if we have, if we can, the text which is lying behind uh, the body of, uh, well, the, the depiction of Uwe. Also, another oddity of this tomb, and it's very fun to highlight and underline, is the fact that many figures, many divinities represented in the decoration of the burial chamber are holding knives. So they are actually acting as like guardians like Hawi, Hawi's job was to be the guardian of Dara Medina. So this is, might be the reason why he, 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 he wanted absolutely to have guardians depicted in the decoration of his burial chamber in order to guard his mummy and maybe also the mummies of his family. So this wife was very important. Unfortunately, all the texts in the bando have disappeared. They were mostly, I would say, we have to think that they were mostly painted in black. And this is the reason, uh, because black pigments have completely fallen down during the fire, we have lost uh, all these texts. So we think that also a multispectral campaign uh, during the coming season could help us retrieve them. And finally, for the uh, step number three, so the step of conserving TT214, and this is yet to come, as you see, the tomb has suffered a lot, so you have cracks, uh, in the chapel, in the burial chamber, you also have uh, some uh, algua, very green spots that have developed, and also some looters in the antiquities have created uh, holes in the walls. So we will need to uh, assess this and to preserve and conserve and reinforce the structure of this tomb in order to ensure its uh, survival for, for, for all the, the coming generations. So this is also something we will carry on over the coming years. During our work, one of the good surprises we had was to find that we could still access a network of 10 burial chambers belonging to two other tombs through the rear end of the chapel, uh, as initially described by Bria. So as you see, this is the sketch he made of these rooms. And on the right image, you see the dark spot in the back. This is the entrance of the, uh, this network. And we thought that this was completely condemned, but no, it was still open. So on the image here produced by Alessandro, you see the entrances of both tombs, the original entrances of this uh, network of timber chamber. But thanks to uh, the uh, photogrammetry, 
made by Alessandro, he has been able to remove all the upper parts of this room, of the, the landscape, and then for us to view. And I have now access uh, virtually to this network of tomb. And also Alessandro has produced, has produced a, a short movie allowing us to visit this network of tomb. So now I want to conclude this part on the TT214 by uh, showing you pictures of uh, most of the people involved in the work of the TT214 and to which I want to extend my uh, thanks. Again, now, this was uh, the work done and still to be done on the, to, over the TT214. Now, what about the TT8? Of course, for the TT8 belonging to Ra, the situation is a bit different. As I already told you, uh, we are already a bit more advanced on the study and understanding of the tomb because uh, the Museo Giccio uh, possess uh, all the objects coming from this tomb. And the reason why uh, this tomb has been unviolated by uh, Schiaparelli is because the burial chamber, where all the objects were coming from, was disconnected 20 meters away from the chapel. And that's the reason why we have been able to uh, what Schiaparelli has been able to find these objects. So you have understand that uh, same thing for the TT214, we wanted to make a prior reassessment, assessment of what we knew of the owner and of the tomb. So by going through the archives that we possess here at Museo Egizio, we found many uh, hundreds, if not thousands of pictures, reports made by Schiaparelli, uh, leading of course to a republication of this report a few years uh, 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 later. Thanks to that, we are now able to pinpoint very precisely where these objects are coming from, where these objects were, so in an effort of recontextualizing them on the spot. So uh, basically, the objects and where they were uh, found, this was already done by uh, our team at Museo Gizio. So what was left to be, to be done was mostly the work, and is still left to be, to be done, is the work on the exterior part of the tomb, so its chapel. So this is why the work that was carried in situ was mostly to get a 3D model of the chapel of the TT8. And this is what uh, that was done, uh, thanks to the help of the IFAO. So we have been able to do this, also to uh, suggest a, reconstru a reconstruction of the outside of the chapel, and also to put back the decoration of the chapel inside uh, the tomb, inside the, inside the chapel itself. So as we were using a lot of new technologies, uh, our colleagues have also conducted, uh, 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 because our colleagues have also conducted archaeometric analysis on many objects coming from the TT8 in order to understand how they had been made and to see what the human eyes couldn't see thanks to new technologies. Uh, this is why they had the idea to uh, create this temporary exhibition uh, still uh, on view at Museo Gizio called Archaeologian Visibile, so allowing the visitors to see the invisible and also to present the new technologies that we have used on the object of TT8, among other things. So here are two results obtained from our, the archaeometric analysis conducted. So you see on both mummies of Ra and Merit, we have been able to virtually unwrap them and to see uh, the jewels that are still covering them. Also uh, in, on the mummy of Merit, the one on, at the bottom left, you will see that she is still having a wig on the head and she's ha she has also carrying, she's also carrying a wig on her chest. So this is also something we've been able to do thanks to new scanning uh, of uh, these mummies, so new technologies. But also thanks to multispectral analysis and XRF, we found which kind of pigments were used in the decoration of the wooden boxes and on, on some objects and uh, among those uh, wooden boxes of Ra and Merit, like the one you have on the screen. By knowing what kind of pigments are used, we are able to adapt the conservation method, but also to highlight where these pigments could come from in Egypt or outside Egypt, so also to get information on the trading routes that would have uh, existed in the antiquity. Now going on the last tomb, the TT338, so these are the archive pictures that we possess, some are of the archive pictures that we possess, so you see the tomb at uh, the time of uh, when it was found, when it was discovered. But when it was discovered, of course, the decoration of the Chapel of Maya, of the 338, 
was still in situ, was still kept inside the mud brick casing of the tomb, as you see uh, today in the image to the left. In 1906, when Schiaparelli found it, he decided to remove, to detach the decoration and to bring it to Turin. So nowadays, what we have left on site in situ is the outside mud brick casing of the chapel, as you see here on the screen. So the work that was uh, left to be done in situ was in fact a virtual work, the, virtual, the, the work of reconstructing the chapel of Naya. And this is what we have done, and uh, thanks to the help of our colleagues from Politecnico Milano. So here you have from the left to the right, the, uh, let's say the replacing of the chapel. So what the work that has been done is they came to Turin, they scanned the decoration that we have in our room, they replaced it virtually inside the mud brick casing of the chapel. Then they completed virtually this mud brick structure. That's what you see in the center image. And finally, we made a suggestion. They suggested the most, I would say the most probable hypothesis on, of how this chapel uh, must have looked like in the antiquity, based on parallels from the same period and mostly the TT8 of Chaim Merit. So we assumed that this chapel was in the shape of a pyramid uh, with only one room, as you see here, with its uh, entrance uh, topped by a, a corniche. And this, uh, let's say, virtual suggestion should be uh, put back in, let's see, the image should be put back on an, an information panel in situ in their own medina, and hopefully we will have also this uh, image uh, on the side of the decoration housed and kept in our collection in the Museo Gitio. So we have here on the screen an image of how this decoration is now housed, you know, kept and shown in, the, in its display in Museo Egizio. And a few weeks ago, we have been also uh, able to replace, to put back inside the chapel, the stila of Maya that was also part of our collection since 1824. And now uh, both uh, objects are now, com let's say, complete the assemblage that we have of uh, Maya. So this is what, that was, let's say, a, a very let's say, brief summary of the work that we have been carried uh, at the Remedine in relationship, in relation to our objects and artifacts that we have in our collection. So uh, I would like really to thank my colleagues and our partner institution that are shown to the screen for to bring all their help, valuable help to uh, our cause and effort that we have uh, we are doing now at Dera Medina. But just before ending, really, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that you can always help us to carry on our activities by uh, supporting us at the following web address. So it's https slash slash donapunto.it. And also, I would like to address a special note to our American-based viewers. So just to let you know that we have recently opened a new bridge linking us to the USA called the American Friends of Muso Gizio. Uh, which has a specially dedicated website. So I encourage you all to have a look at it and to its content. So on this uh, good note, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And I'm very happy to uh, answer uh, all the questions if you have any. Well, thank you very much, Cedric, for this wonderful lecture and extremely informative. You really gave us a, a wonderful overview of all the fieldwork the, the Museo Egizio is doing in the Remedina. Um, just waiting for, for some uh, questions. I would like to, to start with one, uh, or actually uh, maybe a double or, or triple uh, question. Um, about uh, TT214. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you uh, think that um, the fact that the, the, the main chapel uh, remained incomplete, well, the decoration was, uh, was incomplete, uh, might also be linked to the poor quality of the, of the rock, of the mountain uh, where it was uh, excavated and prepared and uh, connected to this question um, i would like to to know if uh, you have plans to 
uh, let's say, uh, do some work of um, to preserve the the area where uh, there was the the collapse, the main collapse um, of the of the mountain uh, on top of the entrance of the burial uh, chamber. And uh, if you plan to 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 make the the burial chamber accessible to to the visitors of the Medina. Thank you, Paolo, for the question. Yes, I, I will, will answer to them uh, backwards. So regarding the opening of the tombs, it's not in our hands. Of course, it's in the hands of the Ministry of Antiquities. So we will give them the key. Well, they have already the keys, but I, I mean, in the virtually, uh, it's just a, the, uh, a, way to, a way to speak. They, it will be up to them to decide if this tomb is um, interesting enough for the visitors compared to the other ones that are open to the public. Also, if its access is quite easy, because the easy access is also something that they are looking for uh, before opening any tombs to the public. That's what I I was doing with them uh, in the past when I was in charge of the mission. So this is uh, something that they have in mind really to, to look for. Regarding the um, conservation of the, of the rock, of course, we don't want to crash our work and we don't want to die as well. So we have started to make a, a thorough, a, a really a good assessment of the, the state of preservation and the, the situation of the rocks and the mountains above our head and above uh, the burial chamber. And it is also planned, it's part of the plan that we should also reinforce the mountain above our head. So what we should do as it has been done some in other places in Egypt, is to build a, a network of a metal beam connecting the mountain, all the, the pieces of the mountain, to create an artificial roof, like a, a metal roof, with a metal beam, a very tall metal beam, just to support them, but not to push them, but really to come beneath it, just in case anything would fall down, it would not fall on our head or nor on the tomb, but it will fall down on this metal network, therefore supporting it forever. So this is also something that we have assessed and we, we, we wish to do uh, in the coming years. Then regarding the, the first question you ask, uh, if uh, 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 regarding the, the state of decoration, and the, the decoration of the chapel, I can compare this chapel very closely with the one, the Titi II, belonging to Khaberenet. Both of them have, uh, bo 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 both tombs have a rock cut chapel, right? Uh, cut in a poor quality limestone. And what both owners have done is to cover that, once it was rock cut, roughly, they covered the walls with a, a lime plaster in some, with some addition of clay plaster in order really to have flat and vertical walls and very flat uh, walls. And it is in this material, so a mix of natural stone, a mix of lime plaster, that the decoration is set up. It's very clear in the TT2, and it is also very clear in the northern jam uh, of the entrance of the TT214. You have a mix of a, a stone that came in addition to support the natural stone, in this case, it's a stone, but it, it came like a puzzle and it's not part of the natural stone. So it's an addition that Rawi or well, the, the one who made the tomb has made. And when you see the inside of the tomb, it was prepared. It was uh, absolutely flattened and whitewashed in order to receive a decoration. So it was really in waiting of a decoration like in the TT tomb, but for an unknown reason, it has not been finished. So this while again, uh, until we, we find another proof, well, or, or another clue, we, we, we think it's because of the, 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 the owner premature's death. But uh, again, uh, if I compare with TT2, uh, I, I assume that the, tomb, the, the chapel was prepared enough to receive the decoration. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we have actually a, um, a question from the public. Yes. And is, um, is it necessary to do analysis to the soil before an excavation to know the component of salt and iron, for instance? Um, yeah, this is the question. Okay, so, uh, well, no. 
um, the, uh, to know the, the, the salt and iron, for instance, and to do analysis of the soil before the excavation, uh, no, we, we don't, uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, having, to, I'm not aware of anything to be done like this uh, in Egypt, at least. I have worked in, in many other, uh, on many other sites. Uh, we have never done that before a, an excavation. What would be done, however, is not on the soil, but on the, the, the pigments on the wall. Like, for instance, on, in the burial chamber. As you've seen, as I showed you, the burial chamber is uh, poorly ba and badly damaged. And it also had some green spots that, have the, that, are, that are there, covering spot, uh, spots in the tombs uh, of the burial chamber. You also have white stains that are there. And our conservator, that came to work with us, Bianca Madden, uh, advised us to do analysis of, on, of these spots in order to understand what it is before making any, uh, let's say, conservation uh, work on it. Because you want always to know what is there before cleaning it. Like, I'm just uh, saying something, um, the carbonate bisodium, we know it reacts very badly with vinegar, but we know vinegar is a very nice uh, product to clean. So if you would bring vinegar to clean bica sodium bicarbonate, the made background, for instance, the white, you would make it uh, vanish, you would make it disappear. So in order to assess the methods of conservation, you need to know then what kind of pigments uh, is there. So this is why we, we don't do this for the soil, but we will definitely do this uh, on the wall. Uh, yes. Yeah, if I can just add something uh, Please, about yes. analysis on, on soils, it's something that you do in archaeology, but not before excavating. Uh, uh, sometimes it happens, you find a specific uh, type of soil and you would like to sample it and to do analysis in order to, to know better uh, what it contains and what, it's the, uh, what it, is, it is made of. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I think um, I would like to ask you something else. Um, you said, of course, the field work that the museum is doing is mainly focused on recontextualization of the of the objects of the museum objects. So, um, do you think the the few uh, fragments that we have? Uh, um, pertaining to how we, uh, they might be connected to the tomb or they might be connected to something else or what do you think? Really, thank you for the question indeed. Uh, well, since uh, the, uh, the chapel itself still has uh, the lintel and door gems, it's definitely not from the chapel. Then, two other options remain. Either these, uh, these fragments, uh, lintel and door gems, they can come from one of the three burial chambers we have, either room number one, two, or three. This is a possibility. Or, uh, of course, these elements could also come from Hawi's house in the village. Um, as far as I know, this house has not been uh, identified. I don't think so. Uh, then, maybe. The thing is also, um, are you aware, Paolo, if these objects are connected to each other? Do, do we no, know? No, I, I, yeah. I don't know that. This is why. So maybe I, I think it is assumed. It they, is assumed. They, but, yeah. but again, since the, there's no proof of that connection, we could even say the door jams are from the house of the village or from the tomb, well, one of the burial chambers, whereas the lintel would come from the house you know, and or another burial chamber. Uh, we know that burial chambers in Dera Medina uh, were, were possessing lintels and door jams made of limestone, so that could be the case. Uh, but we know also that the houses were having these kind of uh, elements, architectural elements. So again, uh, as, as far as I know, and since we don't know, we, we don't have the in situ clue, the clues in situ proving that these elements were attached to this part of the tomb of part of the house, uh, only conjecture and hypothesis can be said. But thank you for having asked the question indeed. Yeah, thank you. 
I just uh, would like to, to ask you something uh, more personal, if you want, um, which is you had the opportunity to, to go down and, and see the, uh, the tomb, uh, the burial chamber, uh, and the entrance to the burial chamber and the, the burial chamber of the tomb of Ha, uh, TT8. So what were your uh, like feelings when, <laughs> when you were there? Because, uh, I mean, f for us, working in the Museo Egizio, it's really kind of a, a myth, uh, this tomb that was found completely untouched and uh, intact and full of all uh, these objects, uh, magnificent objects, and uh, in, in 1906. So uh, what were your, your feelings when you were there? Well, th thank you for the question. Well, well, first of all, knowing all this, uh, I felt very privileged to, to, to go down, of course, and also especially because you need um, not equipment, but you need um, some gear to go down. So that, that, that there has been a special ladder was made. So two very tall ladders were attached together in order to access the bottom of the pit, because the pit is eight meters and a half long, uh, deep, and then no ladders were uh, tall enough to do that. So there has been, a, a, let's say, a small work done in order to uh, allow us the access to the bottom pit. So that was uh, mostly, let's say, the uh, a privilege. This is why I felt it uh, like a privilege. Then to be there, uh, it was really, I would say, amazing. In a way, this tomb is not prepared for the visit, so there's no light. There's no special floor. It's really like it was left by Schiaparelli after. It is so much left like in the state when Schiaparelli left is because, uh, as you know, the, the, the corridor of the tomb was blocked by a mud brick wall. And that, that had been dismantled by Schiaparelli in order to continue. Well, all the, the mud bricks of this blocking are kept inside. They are stored on the side of a, a wall of the corridor. Wow. So we could reconstitute, you know, rebuild the wall as it was uh, when Schiaparelli found it. So you have uh, 20, let's say, roughly 20 mud brick, big mud bricks uh, stored and piled on the side of the wall. So this was quite a surprise to me because I thought that they would have been gone or reused in something else. No, nope, they have been left there. Then uh, it's also nice to see the, the size, really by yourself, the size of the corridor and the size of the, the unique burial chamber that contained all this high number of, uh, you know, objects and artifacts. And then you say, oh my God, I mean, how can they all fit in there? Well, that's the reason why they, need, they had to use the corridor because it was not enough, you know, the, the burial chamber was too small. But also to see the, the, the entrance uh, where the wooden door was, the wooden door that we have in our collection. So this is exactly where it was. And then to see how, you know, because we have the archive pictures in our mind, in our memory. So now you see, oh yeah, so that was the chair, that was the, the, the outside coffin, the other coffin. And okay, so that, yeah. And then you, you get the feeling of the volume and how it was. And, uh, yeah, so, so basically it's, uh, it was very impressive. It's, it's, it was like re-entering the archive pictures for you, <laughs> but in color. So, so yeah, so I, 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 I know you, we, we all wish to, to go back there. So I, I know it will happen, fingers crossed. So yeah, so that would be a so good occasion to <clears throat> have maybe to make some records, uh, recordings of our impressions and feelings when we, uh, we will go there. So, so that was my, my, my feeling when I got there. Well, thank you again for, for the lecture, for the answers, for everything. I will stay here forever, uh, just talking about uh, field work or there in Medina, but we can't. And so um, we thank again all the, the people that were connected and uh, that were seeing us uh, tonight. And, and we say hello. And yes. we give uh, an appointment to, to the next, the future events of the Museo Egizio. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And goodbye and take care. <laughs>